So thank you all for coming out here. Um, this talk is really about what makes things practical, those little things that can stand in the way of something working, like this is the seventh time I've been at Buzzwords, and I actually went to the wrong meeting room thinking I knew the names of the room and wondered why Holden was on the same stage where I thought I was giving a talk. So it's those little practical things that can get in the way of success if you're not careful. We're going to look at how that works with machine learning. This is not to say that the algorithm you pick, the way you build a model is not absolutely essential to success, but that's the kind of exciting, sexy part of it that people tend to focus on and sometimes not look at all the things that are wrapped around that that make a difference for a machine learning system, a machine learning project, to really be a success, not in isolation, evaluated one model against another, but to be a success embedded in real-world business situations. And so that's what we want to look at today. This is me. I'm principal technologist with MapR Technologies based in uh, San Jose. I'm also a committer on a couple of Apache projects, and I've written several short books with O'Reilly. This is my contact information, and I repeat that at the end of the talk. So what we want to look at today are the issues that really make a difference for machine learning, real value in production settings. And so let's start with the obvious fairly specific question you probably all have in your mind already, and that is, what does the chicken plus TensorFlow have to do with success in machine learning? Okay, so we should start with something a little bit fun, but this is a real story as well. We have a friend and colleague, Ian Downard. He's a very good data engineer. He's a software engineer. What he is not is a data scientist. He's never tried machine learning before, but he got very intrigued after he went to a talk by some Google evangelists talking about TensorFlow. He was excited about the idea of deep learning, image recognition, and he really wanted to give it a try but he didn't really have a reason to do it, other than he wanted to give it a try. And so he decided he would apply it at home, kind of a weekend project. Uh, apparently, he has a hen house, and he had some problems, and that some bird was entering the hen house and pecking the eggs before he could get to it. So he thought he could set up an image recognition system that would detect this whoever was coming in and, and pecking the eggs, and that gave him a, a way to save his eggs, and more importantly, an excuse for getting to play around a little with TensorFlow. And that's what he built. So he basically trained a model to be able to recognize these different images. He had two kinds of chickens in his hen house, uh, Rhode Island Red, something called a Buff Orpington, kind of an odd name, and he suspected that what was coming in and pecking the eggs was a J. So he needed to train on these three things, and this is how he basically labeled uh, the detection, the classification categories he was looking for. Now, what kind of lessons can we learn from this? Well, first of all, he's doing image recognition, but what really matters for this project is essentially this. It's a chicken or it's not a chicken. That's what mattered to him. And most importantly in this set situation, this one was potentially a predator. And that gets to the first lesson you can take from this toy project. Domain knowledge really does matter. You have to know a little, not just about the model, but you have to know a little about the system. Are you asking the right question? What's going to bring you value? He had to know, to know what to train, what images to train on beforehand to realize that this was actually a Western scrub jay, and he could get lots of images of scrub jays, and that's what he did. So this person had never done machine learning, very successfully built this model. He wrote a, a nice little blog about it, and he did a lot of things right. There are good lessons in this for even more important projects. Um, he gathered a lot of training data. He had thousands, several thousand images of each type of bird. He trained uh, a TensorFlow model, but he didn't have to build it all from scratch. He took advantage of an Inception V3 model that was basically already constructed, and so someone else had done the heavy lifting. That's why he didn't have to have that intense background as a data scientist to be able to build a model. So image recognition, deep uh, learning is very complicated and very sophisticated, but fortunately now there are some models where somebody can come in and basically get the images uh, 
train a pre-built model, and this is what he did. So he had uh, deployed into his in-house, he had a way to deploy this in a practical way. He had a, a, a camera, so he had motion capture, ran a program for that, had pre-trained on these images. He set up his system so that he had a way that he could retrain the model if he needed to. He deployed this right at the IoT edge, right next to the, the IoT sensor data, in this case his in-house and his camera. Uh, he deployed this just in a little Raspberry Pi. So this is a very simple system. And he then needed to make this a practical system. He needed what? He needed some way to report the results, to report the results. So he had an output that went to a Twitter feed called at Tensor Chicken. So he's got all the pieces there. How well did it work? How can we tell if it's success? Well, first of all, oops, I'm going to go back. First of all, you can look at this tensor. I don't know if you can read this tiny print, but it's kind of dark, but there are two different examples here, one of this Rhode Island red and one of this buff Orbington picture. And if you can actually see the results, he reported the live results in this feed on on Twitter, you can see that the model was correctly classifying these images at very high accuracy. It could recognize this as being Rhode Island Red, it recognized that as being a Buff Orpington. I didn't get a picture where he had a J coming in, but it was a really efficient system. So it looked like a roaring success. It certainly was a success that his original intent was to try this and see if he could do it and, and have some fun with it, and that part worked great. So it was working really, really well. It's an efficient model. But here are some other questions he could ask. I was talking to him and I said, because he was actually trying to stop something from pecking eggs, I said, how long does it take for that image recognition, for that classification to happen? It's just running a Raspberry Pi. He said, about 30 seconds for it to classify an image. I said, how long does it take for a blue jay to peck an egg? Well, the answer is less than 30 seconds. So do we see a problem with this now? As you think about this in a practical way, he has basically a requirement in SLA to have some response faster than this bird is going to peck an egg. This isn't going to work. Now, I was just asking him for fun. Uh, it turns out, I think he got inspired. He works for MapR. Uh, MapR has a wonderful uh, system where you can build or, or deploy a really small footprint MapR cluster right at the, the edge, so you can do edge computing for IoT data. And so he was going to put that in his hen house. I don't know if he ever actually did that, but he had figured he could get this down to uh, uh, a response time that was so fast it was ridiculous by doing it that way, as he said, a bit of over-engineering for a simple project. There's actually a lesson in that, too. Uh, for a lot of things, you do need something to be fast enough to meet your practical requirement, but faster all by itself is not better. If it's fast enough and then you spend time trying to make a model run faster and faster, that's kind of wasted effort. So again, be very aware of what the actual requirements are, what fits, what you need to do to be able to get value if you're doing this in a practical way. There was a separate issue. I said, what are you going to do if you get it running fast enough and you can actually detect that a predator has come in, how are you going to scare it away? Hmm. Well, he hadn't quite figured that part out yet. Uh, we had a little fun thinking of various horrible things you could do to scare a bird away. Unfortunately, most of, most of those would also make your hands not lay eggs. What's basically been the outcome of this is that Ian has gone on. He's changed the tensor chicken out, uh, output on Twitter. I see he's now trying to identify different types of hummingbirds at a hummingbird feeder <laughs> for fun. He's gone on with it. But there really are, in this toy example, some important lessons that apply for real-world situations. By the way, I mentioned earlier that domain knowledge matters, and it does. You need to know a lot about the, the subject matter. Somewhere in the middle of the night when I was writing this up for a report or a chapter in a book, because I thought this was a fun story, I started thinking about the fact that the name Buff Orpington, Orpington's a weird name, but it's, I think, someplace in England, uh, but Buff in English generally means a light tan, kind of even golden color. So this pretty little black chicken with white spots didn't sound like buff in anything. And I got curious, and you can waste a lot of time when you have a chapter due and you should be doing something else. So I started looking for images of chickens on Google, and I discovered that what a buff Orpington chicken looks like actually is this. 
Somebody had sold him eggs. They told him what kinds of chickens they were. Turns out that wasn't true. And so I contacted Ian, I thought it was hilarious, and said, I think you have a different kind of chicken. It turned out to be uh, called a, a Plymouth Rock, uh, the chicken that he had. Well, it turns out he actually went back and retrained his model because he wanted to see if he could get it to work. And it's wonderful. You can watch in the evaluation of the models as one changes and the other comes up. Again, a good lesson in a toy, uh, a toy uh, project. But there's also a lesson here. He was embarrassed he had his chicken labeled wrong, but for the purposes of that project, if you think about it as being trying to identify a predator, again, this becomes uh, over-engineering. You don't, it's wrong and that's too bad, but all that mattered is that you can say it's a chicken and it's not the predator. So it actually didn't matter that he had it named wrong in terms of how the project was supposed to work. So these are some of the serious uh, lessons that come out of this incredibly simple project one I haven't mentioned, and I think maybe it's the most important one, is that there is a very important role for data engineering in machine learning systems. And I think people are really increasingly recognizing that. For these systems to work in a real world situation, to actually be deployed in a sustainable and reasonable way into production, it's absolutely important that you're able to handle the logistics of gathering data, training, getting the training data for a model, adjusting data that's input data uh, later as the model is deployed into production. How do you keep all of this system running? How do you manage the models? There are a lot of places where the characteristics, the, the, the skills that a person has as a software engineer add to that some data skills, and this becomes a very powerful profession right now uh, to be a data engineer. And so there's a real role for that. Uh, in this case, it was a little unusual because Ian was doing this project on his own because of that convenience of a pre-made model, uh, the Inception V3 TensorFlow model that he could just customize. And there's a hint too, in some cases, a simple model actually works very well if it fits what you're trying to do in a situation. And sometimes a data engineer can do this and you don't always need a PhD level data scientist for all of this. But even projects that are very complicated where you really need a serious data science team, there's a huge role for the data engineer. But the part that I saw in this that I found the most interesting is that for these things to work in the real world, you need the data engineers to be excited about doing this work. Ian was really fired up about this. I mean, he spent some time, he got this going on his own. It's exciting to him to see how these projects work and to be an integral part of it. And that carries over to real world situation. So before we go forward, I have a few questions for, for you, the audience. How many people in here uh, are working now or have recently worked on machine learning projects? Can we see a show of hands? Just about everybody. How many people in here would call themselves data scientists? Some of you, not all of you. How many see them yourselves more as an engineer, as a data engineer, or in that role? So again, a mix. How many people came because they're interested in chickens? <laughs> no, okay, just checking. All right. So as you can see, there's a mix even in this audience, and I think that really is the formula for success as we see that those roles need to work together. The data engineer takes a lot of the pressure off of the data scientist to make sure that these aspects of a project are done correctly. The data scientist is supplying that expertise for the model and the algorithm itself. Those things need to work together. So let's look at some real-world examples. And the first one is also an example where uh, it's not the only importance about it, but it's also an example where the domain knowledge matters. This is a situation where uh, a person had built a uh, video recommendation system. Uh, the person doing this was a data scientist, knew a lot about algorithms and so forth. But it actually does matter uh, to be aware of how are you posing your question? Are you using the right data? You're trying to see uh, the preferences of people watching these videos. And so if you say, is a model success, you're evaluating that model. Is the model successful? Does it perform well? Then you say, is it actually able to identify preferences and, and say these are the, the outstanding things? And it did very, very well, except in the end, it wasn't a good recommender in terms of the audience because it was originally trained on using clicks on these videos. And if you think about it, what clicks on videos tell you is it tells you how well people like the title of the video. That's what captures their attention. 
If you want a better recommender, you have to actually look at the first few seconds of, of viewing. In this case, 30 seconds turned out to be a good number. And now you're actually being able to gauge that behavior is now telling you something about the person's preference for the video as opposed to whether there's catchy title. So it's not a change in the algorithm, it's a change in making the right choice about that input data. This was a real business. It made a tremendous amount of difference for the business to make that small adjustment. So these things really do matter. Another example that comes from a real-world situation is a person who is an expert in security for financial institutions. And in one situation, he had been saving all of the, the headers for website interactions and saving more detail than you think that you might want. And it wasn't because he was looking for any specific thing. He just wanted the best possible records of what normal behavior looks like what normal behavior looks like interacting with this website. Now, why was he interested in normal behavior? Because, of course, he wanted to be able to recognize abnormal beha behavior. He wanted to see those uh, outliers as they happen, and that's exactly what happened here. So the lesson here to look for is this person is actually very sophisticated in his ability to do this. I think I'm allowed to. He, he works for MAPR now. Uh, we've known him for years. He was actually one of the people who helped track down what happened in these, uh, I believe it's called Ababil attacks several years ago, which were very serious uh, large-scale attacks by a foreign entity. Um, so this is somebody with a lot of experience and uh, very sophisticated in this field. But it turns out in this situation, what actually mattered is something in itself that's incredibly simple. And it is simply noticing the difference in the ordering of these elements in these headers. Now, the normal situation on the right here, the real request, differs from the attacker request, but this difference, this behavior, is not something in itself that would interfere with function. It's not something even a sophisticated person could predict. It's not something you can look for. Okay, you wouldn't know which piece of this to look for, but the point is simply that it's different. It shows up not as normal behavior because it isn't normal behavior. It's a bot doing something, it's not a human, and this makes a big difference. And another example, in this case, the attacker request now on the other side is a difference in whether you start these lines uh, with a capital letter or a small letter. Why I'm showing you these examples are, these are situations where, again, having some domain understanding, it's not so much the sophistication, this is fairly simple modeling to do, but you have to know what to look for or have systems that are ready to look for things. The other lesson here is that you have to be able to uh, preserve data even in some cases where you don't know exactly how it will be needed later. And what aspects of that data are important in one situation uh, may be the parts you would have thrown away. So raw data is really very valuable for machine learning. Obviously, it's going to be processed. You're going to add various things to it as you develop uh, data for training, as you develop input data for a model. But if you can preserve raw data, you can't preserve everything, but to whatever extent you can preserve raw data, that gives you some really powerful options in the future as you start to do uh, new, new projects, new systems, or even within the system you're working on, as you realize something that you might have thrown away as a feature actually matters. And fortunately, m really good, really efficient, modern distributed systems make it possible to do that, to store that data and get access to it, and for people to do it uh, really in, in even in large companies that are distributed across different locations, you don't always know what you're going to need, and yet it's pretty easy to get access to that kind of comprehensive view of data when you need it. Now, that's different from trying to preserve data. That's the actual data you're using for training a model, and we'll talk about that a little later. That has another practical value. Let's switch to one more real-world system. Uh, there's a lot of machine learning being done in uh, areas where uh, big industrial systems, uh, certainly where IoT data is being produced. Um, some of the examples I've given you so far is to say that what can make a machine learning project successful and very valuable is actually the, the knowledge that you put into it, are you asking the right question? Sometimes the model itself is fairly simple, not that hard to build. 
can you deploy it in the right way, those can have huge impact. But certainly there are these other systems where that model is very, very complicated. Um, one of the examples that gets the most attention lately are people working with autonomous cars. Uh, those are not simple kind of decision processes for a machine learning model. In those cases, you're not looking for just a right answer. Let's take the example, you're driving up the road, your system comes back and tells your car, make a right turn at this intersection. Now, if you have a navigation system and that's a reasonable route to where you're going, saying turn right might be the right answer. If there happens to be a bus or a pothole or a small child standing in the way, turning right at that moment is very much not the right answer. Those are systems that are complicated. They have to process data very effectively, process it in real time. Uh, it's an interactive system where basically you're constantly getting data, adjusting the, the choices and the insights. Those are very complicated systems. Uh, they're very, very valuable, and there are a number of different areas where you see modeling like that being done. Certainly in transportation, uh, throughout the medical industry, people are also beginning to use machine learning, AI, in situations in medical research, in other situations that are therapeutic where we're assisting uh, human-driven decisions by initial analysis of images, for example. Not something simple like chickens and blue jays, but much more complicated I images where you're assisting uh, uh, histology and so forth, uh, scannings, MRIs, and, and being able to su supply that data back to the doctor uh, so that she or he can more easily make uh, a decision and a decision about the patient. So there's some very, very complicated examples, especially in this world and especially in the world of large-scale industry and machinery. Manufacturing is changing completely right now. It's making itself into something new. Uh, an example that I've seen recently is up in northern England. Uh, UK has set up a research center called the Advanced Manufacturing Research Center, or AMRC. And they're doing a lot of research where they're actually taking in-production systems with 100 or 200 big companies. I think Boeing is the one that's been the most prominent, so their name is attached with it. And they're putting that in direct contact with the, the latest sort of state-of-the-art engineering knowledge from the university. And these are systems where the, the engineers are literally sitting right on the floor of a reconfigurable factory called the Factory 2050. Uh, it's a wonderful example where at every level of the process from planning, actual production, coming in, testing, a lot of it is for automotive, a lot of it is for uh, things in the, the uh, uh, aerospace industry. Uh, there are other examples as well. But these are being put, you know, a very short pipeline between research and new ideas, innovation, directly into what's happening in, in these companies. And they're training up people um, who are able to work with uh, basically smart tools. I mean, you have all these sophisticated ideas coming out and somebody's going to work on the assembly line who's actually going to be able to do that. So these systems are changing very fast. Certainly there's practical value in that. Now having said that, I'm going to turn around and show you a system that's just the obvious opposite, but it's in the same industry or in the same arena. All of these situations, whether you have uh, a telecommunications company, you have uh, manufacturing, you have large-scale transportation, you have people in the oil and gas industry, and all of these situations, very sophisticated businesses, but they're businesses, and they have all the basic challenges and issues of basic business processes. They have to track what's going on with the business. They need to track metrics of what's working or not. If they're also customer facing, they need to track aspects of their impact, customer relations, customer services, what happens with marketing. And what do all of these companies have in common is billing and revenue. And that makes a big difference. So we're talking about practical situations that have can have huge impact and huge value. And it turns out one of the greatest skills that a data scientist can have is not just that sophistication of the algorithm and the model, but it's the ability to look at these businesses, to recognize those places where using machine learning can optimize or automate a step 
And if that step can have tremendous impact, actual uh, value to the system, to the company, uh, that's a, a really ripe place for machine learning. And so again, they're not the, the examples that I think get written up a lot right now with all these very sophisticated AI systems. They can be very simple or they could be sophisticated, but they can make a tremendous difference. So in one particular case, uh, this is a large industry, I can't say which one, but it uh, happens to be a MAPR customer. Um, but they have uh, to deal with a tremendous amount of, of machinery. And they're looking, they're having to track and label uh, various actions that were taken, uh, supplies, repairs that were done, uh, deliverables out to other customers. They also have to track uh, parts and equipment that are brought in and parts that are being moved into different parts of the, the company. So all of this has to be tracked. It's not the exciting part of this business, but it's very important. And it gets each item, each system, each action gets labeled. Now, what happens if those labels are applied incorrectly? Or somebody gets in a hurry and they just put miscellaneous on a label? Well, that can have a tremendous impact because the way these different actions and parts are labeled is act actually determines whether they're taxed. It determines whether they can be written back against uh, uh, expenses, basically. It, it's something that determines whether they're billable out to another, uh, another client. Is it part of their revenue stream? This is a tremendous difference to the business, and yet it's a very simple step. It's being done all over the business by a lot of people, and often these pieces are mislabeled. And so we had a data scientist who came in, talked to people there, figured out that that simple step of mislabeling, sometimes mislabeling, or just generically labeling things as miscellaneous, was causing this company to miss out on the opportunity of saving or collecting tens of millions of dollars. And so he set up uh, an automated system not to change the labels, but basically a detection system to look for patterns that would alert people in an audit to classes of these labels that look potentially like they might be mislabeled. So that reduces the auditing to focus in, to target in on the things that are going to make a difference. And so this was done, it was done fairly quickly, and through that simple step of recognizing those steps within a business where a decision process, where there's a bottleneck, where there's an error, something that automating could make that worthwhile literally uh, was worth tens of millions of dollars for this company. And the specifics have to do with that company, but that pattern, that situation, you would find in a lot of different companies. And so if you're really looking at how to make machine learning valuable, how to make a system a success, again, it isn't always about the algorithm itself, but it's about what you build around it. Does it fit into the business? Is your, is your successful model running like an engine that's out of gear? Or is it connected into a real action that you can take? Now let's take that last thought of, is it connected to a real action you can take? And let's jump back to the idea of uh, our friend with the hen house and the image recognition. We said he hadn't thought through what action would you take to be able to scare away a blue jay. That was the missing action. He had an action, and some people say, oh, my machine learning system is set up to have an, an actionable step at the end. But what they're seeing as an actionable step is a report. I mean, in his case, it was reporting the stuff to, to Tensor Chicken. A report is not, a, it's, I mean, it's good. You need to track what's happening. But just reporting what's going on isn't really an actionable step. It doesn't connect you to things that will bring that real business value. I see somebody nodding. I suspect you have run into this <laughs> in the real world. Jumping back to this example that happened with the large-scale industry, what was another thing that was cool about that example is not just that they detected that there could be errors, but it was set in a way that was practical for their flow of business so that they could have, you know, basically human audits that could then go in and, and take an action, take a change, and save that money. So it is really the responsibility of people on the, the data science team the data engineering, data scientists together, either they need to see where those actions can be taken or they need to be able to communicate with people within the business who are the ones who have, will be able to take the action or identify it for them. They need to work together and identify that. And if you don't do that, really what you're doing is kind of a fun 
weekend project might be a little bigger than a weekend project if it's for a business, but it's not going to bring those practical results. Now, making a shift, I've been saying that one of the things that matters the most uh, for machine learning to work is not just the algorithm or the model itself, but it's the logistics, the data, managing models, all of that together and connected into real business action. Um, when you talk to people about what's the most important machine learning tool, we find that people use a lot of different uh, tools. Uh, it's not to say they're all equal, but most people doing this successfully have four or five or, or six different uh, machine learning tools to actually build algorithm that they like. Another little, I'm curious about the audience, always uh, your experience. So I'll just say, uh, has anybody in here used H2O? Oh, I'm surprised, no one, I, so I recommend that, two people. Uh, it's, it's a great system, but really good for deep learning for other things as well. MXNet, TensorFlow, CAFE, a show of hands there. There are a lot of different tools and new ones will keep coming. Most people ha keep a kind of a toolkit or several tools, but in some ways, the single tool that matters the most because it supports all of those and it supports that next machine learning specific tool that you're going to add you know, next year that you don't know about yet is to have the platform capabilities that actually handle the logistics and handle them in a, an efficient and consistent way especially in a large business, across different systems because you don't want to have to build all of these from scratch for every system. And that, again, are the places where you can actually bring this kind of practical uh, success that makes a big difference. So in some ways, it's really the logistics that make the biggest difference for machine learning to work. Now, with that in mind, this isn't the only way to do it, but I want to throw a thought out there, plant a thought, is streaming is an incredibly uh, powerful way to build an architecture. Uh, streaming matters because it supports microservices. Um, I think I misread that little time signal, so I'm going to speed up here. I was slowing down because I thought it was incredibly slow. Um, Streaming is at the heart of, can be at the heart of an architecture. It's not just for real-time applications. And what really matters is the stream transport system. If you want to do microservices, you need a stream transport system in the style of Kafka, Apache Kafka example, Map Our Streams is an example, where you're not broadcasting the results to a, a group of consumers, but they're actually subscribing it. And it's that decoupling between producers and consumers and between consumers and each other that really matter. The message is there, it's ready to be consumed immediately, that's good for real time, it doesn't have to be used right away, the consumer doesn't have to be online, and that's what gives you that kind of independence um, that really is at the heart of microservices, so you can use streams as the lightweight connectors between microservices. So holding that idea in mind, I uh, also want to remind you that I think most people in here do machine learning, so this is not news, but people think that you know, in machine learning involves building the model, obviously involves building a lot of models, often hundreds of models, and you have to have some way to handle uh, the management, the deployment of those models, the evaluation, and also uh, the data that you're using. And so, really, the logistics can be very challenging. You're using data from many different data sources, obviously at big scale. You have a lot of different models that you need to be able to handle. You want to be able to evaluate them model to model in an effective way. But a good style is to also be able to have a number of good enough models that are already up and running. They're basically waiting in the wings, and when you want to deploy them into production, you can roll it out, and indeed roll it back if you need to, essentially a system where all you have to do to deploy a new model is not to fire it up, but simply to stop ignoring it. You've been saying, wait, 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 and now you say go. And this gives you tremendous flexibility. Now, there's more than one way to do that, but one of the systems that we've talked about is what's called a rendezvous architecture. Uh, Ted Dunning, who's here in the front row, and I uh, wrote a short book about this last year called Machine Learning Logistics. And we talked about this system, which is based on the idea of streaming microservices, where you're actually using streams not only to have those advantages of handling data or adding you know, whatever you need uh, to raw data to really build input data for, uh, for models, but you're looking at a whole system of models. You build a rendezvous server, and that server is constantly making decisions. It's seeing the input, it's looking at the output scores from all of the different models, and request by request, it's based 
basically making a decision of what is the best choice in that moment for that single uh, request, what's the best system to fit a set of basically pre-configured SLAs. You've determined what constitutes the right uh, choices for that moment. And it's constantly making that decision so it can roll one model in, one ro model back. It gives you that enormous amount of flexibility. So it's really looking at the scores, looking at the request by request, looking at all these different models and making that decision. That's what's at the heart of this rendezvous approach. As I said, we wrote about it in this book. I'll give you that contact information at the end. One of the things to point out about this system is that it is very important to be able to identify input model uh, data for a model exactly. So we recommend running a decoy uh, model. This is, looks like a real model. It takes the input data, it doesn't do anything with it, and it just archives it. That might not be a good idea if you didn't have complete independence of the microservices, but in this kind of system you do. That gives you a very valuable record of what was used as input data. That combined with being able to deploy models into containers, you have a way to, to test and retest things, evaluate them in very predictable and reproducible systems. Another aspect of the rendezvous system is to have what's called a canary model. And so the canary model is a model that's deployed into production. It's doing well. It gives you a kind of baseline for what is reasonable, adequate performance. If you roll a new model out, you can actually quickly do a comparison of the performance of that canary model and a new model. And that difference, you want things to be better, but if it's too different, you know, that's a flag that maybe there's something wrong. So it gives you a kind of a, a stabilizer on uh, production systems to make sure everything's going pretty well. So, rendezvous syst this architecture is a really good way to handle machine learning logistics for simple systems that are basically decisioning, where you have a, a, a yes-no sort of, animal. not yes-no, but you're looking for a specific answer, not these kind of complex interactive systems, such as an autonomous car. Um, this has also been talked about. Uh, we wrote an entry in the Encyclopedia of Big Data Technologies recently in Rendezvous Architecture, also in streaming uh, microservices. Other things that are happening in this area that are new, uh, MLflow is handling some of the early aspects of handling data and so forth, input data for models, a way to handle management and logistics that way. Uh, that one comes out of Databricks. Clipper is coming from the RISE lab at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, this is a really interesting system. Uh, some of the goals and some of the aspects of that design are, are similar to some of the, the ways, the, the issues that the rendezvous architecture are trying to attack. Um, Things will change. Oh, I just want to remind you, I think there's a slide or I missed a slide here. Since uh, Ted talked about rendezvous here at Buzzwords a year ago, it was very new, it was before we written the book. Since then, several people have implemented this. Uh, some large companies are in the process of building the server. Uh, and so it is something that's happening and there have been some questions about larger projects going together and trying to build these. So if you have any interest in working on a project to build a rendezvous server, please contact me or contact Ted. Uh, the last issue here I just want to mention is when you're working in systems where you need flexibility, you know you want to be able to respond to, we don't say if conditions change, you know they will change. That's one reason you want a system like Rendezvous that can roll models out easily, roll them back. No matter how good a model is and how well it fits a situation, the outside world will change. But in addition to the flexibility in terms of the design of your data flow, workflow, the design of the technologies that you're using, if you have a really rigid structure in terms of the human interactions, that can still be a barrier to success. And so I'm talking more and more to people who are taking an approach of uh, using a style we're calling, data, they're calling data ops. It's extending the DevOps approach, but including these data heavy roles like data science and data engineering. I think to a lot of people, this sounds like fluffy buzzword markety stuff. But we've talked to some people who are, their consulting companies are almost entirely focused on taking big data systems into production. And one person I asked recently really surprised me. I said, what's the single biggest barrier to people being successful in production? And he said, they need to have a data ops approach. It's absolutely not what I thought he would pick as the, the, the central theme. 
This has real power, despite all the buzzy things that are being said about it. And it's as simple as the fact that you need people across these different skills. You need to break through skill gills. You need for people to feel that they're part of the same project. They're focused on the same goals. And that way, somebody with one set of skills, somebody with another set of skills, a data scientist, a data engineer, if they ask for help from each other, it's not like they're doing a favor they've imposed on you know, whatever's a normal uh, workflow for that person, is they are part of the same system. And that change, that focus on a shared goal, can make a tremendous difference in the time to value, the efficiency of how people work. And you can capture some, some of that excitement that our friend uh, Ian Downard had as a data engineer when he found he was part of a machine learning project. So that's the most important, my, important part of my message today. And I'll remind you, uh, you'll have slides at the end. We have this book. We had an earlier book where we talked about streaming architecture, which is the basis for this kind of architecture. I uh, wrote a book on Apache Flink with Costa Sumas from Data Artisans. I'm a big fan of Flink. So if you want to do some fast processing, that's a great way to do it. Please help support women in technology. It's really good, not just for women, but it's good for society. And this is from one woman in tech. I say thank you very much.